Sabbath to all. It's working. Is it on? It's on. By the way, should I get a mic instead? seconds to a minute. Go. So Jesus is continuing on 
in this theme of hypocrisy that we talked about, that we touched, uh, we touched on last time we spoke. And there are a lot of lessons that we can learn here today. But I'd like to start in verse 29. But before I do, let me have a quick word of prayer with all of you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. It's good to be back here and to be studying the word together, praising your name together, uh, being exposed to, to the beauty of music. And we just ask, Lord, that we may leave this place with the enhanced understanding of your love towards us. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' conversation uh, in chapter 11 had started with people asking Jesus for a sign right after Jesus had cast out a, de a demon from a demon-possessed man. And when we get to verse 29, it says, And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. So Jesus is pointing forward to his death and resurrection, right? When he's talking about the sign of Jonah, other versions talk about the fact that just as Jonah was in the belly for three days, right, and three nights, so Jesus points to the reality that he is going to die, but he's going to resurrect. Then verse 31 says, The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the man of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But indeed, someone greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh, remember Nineveh and, no and Jonah? They wicked, wicked nation, wicked capital of the Assyrians. They will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. So to summarize, Jesus is pointing to the fact that in the past there were circumstances where the hearts of the people was still malleable, right? It was still there was still room for change. Wicked people like the Assyrians and Nineveh and even people that were not even Jews came coming from far away to, to, to see what Solomon had done. But Jesus is saying, somebody greater than Solomon is here, somebody greater than Jonah is here, but your hearts have been hardened. Your hearts have been hardened. What do you do when light is exposed to you and you do not pay attention to that light? And that's what happened in the following verses when Jesus talks about the lamp of the body being the eye. How do we perceive? They have been blessed with the light of the world, Jesus Christ, but by their rejection or by the cold heartedness or by their unwillingness to listen to Jesus, they were rejecting this light. And when you reject light, you become a source of, of darkness. But when you accept the light of the world, when you apply the, his teachings to your life, you become now a source of light. And this is what Jesus is talking about in these first verses. But now we jump to verse 37. And I want you to follow with me here because it's quite a long portion here. But a significant portion. And you'll understand why. Verse 37 says, And Jesus spoke... Actually, and as Jesus spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went and sat down to eat. So this was normal. Jesus received several invitations from people from different backgrounds. Jesus hung out with those who are accused of being gluttons, right? And the drums. But Jesus also mingled with those that were the spiritual leaders. He didn't take sides when it comes to mingling. So he comes to this house and he sits down and verse 38 says, when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that Jesus had not first washed before dinner. Now, this is not you should wash your hands after before you eat kind of deal. OK, this is not nothing to do with hygiene here. This has to do with the traditions that the Pharisees had created. On when it comes to ceremonial things 
not biblical things, but traditions that they developed as to how they should proceed before eating meals. So it's not like Jesus is breaking a mosaic law. Jesus is just not paying attention or not focusing on these traditions that the Pharisees had developed through time. So it's interesting. Think about this. Think about the scene. Jesus, this famous preacher by now, this miracle worker with this great reputation, had just cast out a demon, possessed man. He walks to have a meal with this Pharisee. And the first thing that the Pharisee is marveled with is the fact that Jesus doesn't wash his hands. It's interesting that the same group, when Jesus cast out a demon, some were marveled, but others were skeptic because they thought that Jesus was casting out a demon by the power of the devil, right? The demons. So it's interesting how this Pharisee is unwilling to recognize Jesus, right? As being a source of godliness. He is not marveled by the fact that Jesus is bringing relief to people. He is marveled by the fact that Jesus is not washing his hands. That's what marvels him. Not the good things and the miracles that Jesus has performed. What marvels this man is the fact that Jesus does not wash his hands according to the traditions of, of the Pharisees. Verse 39. Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and and wickedness. And this response has a lot to do with what we have been talking about connecting with the previous sermon on outward appearances. The focus on the outside. Everything is adorned on the outside, but if we are empty inside. We are a house that is easily taken over by the opposing spirits. So Jesus focuses on that. He's saying you're focusing on the outside and you're forgetting that your heart is full of greed and wickedness. Then he says, Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also, but rather give alms of such things as you have? Then indeed all things are clear, clean to you. And now Jesus enters a section of woes. Now, woes, we could say that woes is like the opposite of blessing, right? When we are blessed, that means that God's favor is upon us. When there's a woe cast on us, that means that God's favor is not upon us. That there is something wrong in how we have been living our life. So Jesus starts off by saying, But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rule and all manner of herbs, but you pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So Jesus is going for the nerve here. Jesus is saying that these Pharisees, they have been focusing all they are, their attention in less important things, and they have been overlooking the core of the gospel, the core of Jesus' teaching, and that is to love and bring justice to the world that we live in. Jesus is not rejecting. He's not saying, don't tithe. Your tithing is not important. No, he's saying, you are focusing on the external things, and you are forgetting how to live as Jesus lived. Or how to live as God wants us to live. Bringing justice and love to the world that we live in. So that's the first one. Focusing on less important things rather than the most important things. Verse 43 continues and he says, Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. And now Jesus' attention focuses on the fact that the Pharisees focus has been on on themselves they like to receive the honors they like to receive the attentions it's okay babies cry guys okay it's okay babies cry that's how the pharisees were feeling inside when jesus was saying these things 
focus on our attention, focus in gaining reputation. You see, there's a big problem when we focus on us alone and our reputation alone rather than focus on Jesus. But Jesus continues on verse 44. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Now what is Jesus saying? There were some graves at the time that were not seen, and you know that very well in the tradition, at least in the legislation of Mosaic law, that when you came in contact with a tomb or a corpse, you became unclean. So what happens when you are walking around and you become unclean without knowing it, right? Because you have stepped on an unmarked tomb. So Jesus is saying that the Pharisees, how they live their life, they are like unmarked graves. They come in contact with people and they contaminate them, bringing death instead of life. Because the reality is the gospel should bring life. The moment you are allowing these opposing spirits to take over and that your focus is only on self and your appearances, then what happens? You become a source of death. People come and contact you, and sometimes even unknowingly, they become contaminated by that toxic persona that you have acquired through your life. Now, verse 45 says, Then one of the lawyers... And when I say lawyers, it's the scribes, the teachers of the law. They answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. So this clearly shows that this is not a private dinner or a private meal between Jesus and one Pharisee. There were probably other Pharisees and lawyers around, teachers of the law around. And when the teachers of the law saw what Jesus was saying, they felt attacked. Because much of the accusation was fitting very well with what they have been doing. So they come and say, teacher, when you say these things, you're talking about us as well. What does Jesus say? <laughs> he devils down. Jesus says, woe to you also, lawyers. For you load man with burdens hard to bear. And you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So it's the whole idea of do as I tell you, but don't live as I live, right? It's bringing burdens upon people, telling how people should be living when we ourselves are not living to that standard. And that's the danger even within churches, right? That's when we touch on the whole idea of hypocrisy. That's where mercy has to take over the hearts of our members and ourselves. Because the moment that we start expecting things from people that we are unwilling to live out, that's the core of what hypocrisy is all about. Jesus has another one. He says, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, which was a way of honoring the prophets, right? Building them tombs. You build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers kill them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Okay, let's summarize, right? Jesus just spoke a lot of things here. He's simply talking about the inconsistency. You honor people in the external level. These prophets that taught the gospel, that taught how to live. However, you only honor them in appearances. But when it comes to living out, you are not willing to change the status quo. You are not willing to heed to the voice of the prophets. Why? Because you'd rather do what you think instead. You have killed the prophets. But you honor them through appearances. But you have killed the prophets. You killed
because you were unwilling to listen. In verse 52, Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who are entering in you hindered. In other words, Jesus is saying that there are people that are wanting to understand. There are people that are searching. But instead of enabling people or helping people find the truth, they became obstacles of truth. The verse closes by saying, And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. Because in the end of the day, my friends, Whenever we have no arguments, the easy thing is to accuse, right? Now, why am I saying all of these things um, and why I thought it was very proper to talk about this passage uh, specifically for this Sabbath is because we are entering into the new year, right? And as I asked for you to do in the beginning is for you to share with those around you what are your new year resolutions. I have, if you are not as creative, and if you are searching, I have six New Year resolutions for you to think about as you move on to the year 2020. Things that you can apply it to yourself, but things that have to do also with us as a congregation and as a church. And these six resolutions are exactly the opposite of the woes that Jesus gave to the Pharisees and the scribes. How should we be living our life? How should we respond to this message? Because we want God's favor and blessing upon us. We don't want to knowingly, knowingly make the mistakes that the Pharisees and the scribes made. Because that's why these stories are here. These stories are present in scripture so that we may, that we may learn from them. So now, let's start with the first one. May our emphasis be on the weightier matters of the gospel. My friends, this should be our focus on God's love and how we should treat one another. I've shared this before. Sometimes people are more concerned about, you know, what the Pope said or the Pope sneezed or, or this or that or, or the prophecy of this rather than the core things of the gospel. They are more concerned about the curtains of the church. They are more concerned about the details that I'm not saying they're not important. They are relevant. But they forget the, the weightier matters of the gospel. We've all been there. I've, all, I've been there. And this is something that we need to be reminded on a daily basis. Because we need to understand that there is a core. That there is weightier matters to how we should live our life. And Jesus emphasized this by saying that you shall love God with all your heart. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's number one. May we focus, emphasize, the weightier matters of the gospel. Obviously, without discarding the lesser things. Number two. May our actions and our way of life lead people to focus on Jesus rather than our accomplishments. This is for me. This is for you. When I come up here, I have to fight the temptation of knowing that what I'm speaking on is not for my glory. It's for God's glory. The things that we do, the ministries that we have as a church should be for God's glory and not for our glory. Everything that you do in your life, is it to uplift Christ or is it to uplift yourself? For 2020, may our actions and our way of life lead people to focus on Jesus rather than in our own personal accomplishments. Because when Jesus is lifted up high, he will draw everyone to, to himself. When we are lifted up high, that does not happen. Number three. May our influence be on, may our influence be one that brings life instead of death. May it uplift people rather than bring them down. May it bring positivity rather than negativity. 
And my friends, this is a choice. This is a choice that sometimes it's a long-term journey of change. But we know very well there are times that we wake up and it feels like everything we do is bringing negativity to our environment. It's only about complaints. It's only about dissatisfaction. And we are not bringing positivity to the environments that we're in, either in the church, either in the family, either in the workplace. We are called to be light. We are called to bring life. But when we are living a life only on negativity, we are bringing death instead. You know what brings life? Is when we choose to allow our whole life to be the temple of the Spirit. When we allow love, forgiveness, reconciliation, patience, kindness to take over. We'll be bringing life. We'll be leading a life that uplifts people and brings positivity. That's number three. Number four, may we bring relief to those around us rather than placing upon them unnecessary burdens. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt bothered by something that somebody did? Just because that's your perspective and not something that is actually grounded in Scripture. It can be the simple things. Sometimes it's the more serious things. But in the end of the day, we as Christians, as a church, we have been called to bring relief to people. The moment we start bringing more and more rules, the moment we start to bring more and more things that people ought to do, we are not doing the ministry of the kingdom. Because people shouldn't be shamed for not adapting to your worldview. People need to be motivated to live out the principles that we find in Scripture. Everything that is outside of Scripture, everything that is just tradition, should be seen as tradition and perspectives. Are we bringing relief, or are we adding more burdens? May we bring relief to those around us, my friends. Number five. May we have openness to the teachings that challenge our status quo instead of seeking to silence it with our hatred and indifference. This is something that is hard for many of us because whenever we get to a certain point in life, sometimes it's early in life, sometimes it's later in life, we are comfortable with what we know. Change sometimes is hard. Change sometimes is painful. The Word of God is always challenging the status quo. We should never be content with the status quo. We should always be striving to grow. We should always be striving to improve, to allow change for the better to take place. And that can only happen when we have a perspective or the disposition to have an open heart to what God has to teach us. Have we had this openness in 2019? Hopefully, 2020 could be a better year where that openness can make that challenge and that challenge can lead us to a better and different and transformed life. May we not silence the voice of truth, the voice of challenge with our hatred and our indifference. And the last thing, which is one of the woes in reverse, is that may we be a bridge that leads people to the knowledge of Jesus instead of being a wall, an obstacle that prevents them from finding truth. See, when I was making this last point based on what Jesus was teaching here, I was thinking many people might have the question, how can we become an obstacle for the knowledge of Jesus? See, if we are to be representatives of Jesus in this earth, the moment that we live according to the opposite principles of Jesus, we are giving those around us a wrong perspective of who Jesus is. 
I know for a fact that many of you know at least one person that is not in church or has rejected Christianity or has rejected Christ or God because they have been disappointed by the people of the church, right? Though this was something that we spoke about already. Those who were supposed to be the representatives gave a wrong perspective of who Jesus was. And that was the perspective that they thought that God was like. So what happens Instead of people coming to Jesus because we have been a bridge, we become now what? A wall. We become an obstacle with this wrong perspective of godliness, with this wrong perspective of Christianity. We lead people astray because it's more about how different we are from others rather than what Jesus is like. His love, his character, and what he came to do when he came to this world. So for 2020, my friends, may we be that bridge that leads people to the knowledge of Jesus instead of being a wall, an obstacle that prevents them to find him. And that can take place in this building. That can take place in your workplace, in your family. My prayer for 2020 is that this church, as a collective group, but also in their individualities, that we could be that bridge. Because one of my prayers for 2020 is that this baptismal tank could be used more often. But that doesn't happen with one person. That doesn't happen with two people. That happens when we are united with a purpose. That happens when we have been convicted that we must be that bridge. If there is a person in your family that does not know Jesus, be that bridge. If there is somebody in your workplace that does not know Jesus, be that bridge. If there is somebody in your neighborhood, be that bridge. Because if there was something that Jesus never had was fear. So fear must be put aside. We must re realize that there are people that are hurting. There are people that are desperate. And the antidote for all of these things is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we are this close from bringing them this knowledge through the way that we live, but also through our teaching. But for some reason, we are discouraged because for some reason, society says that doing these things is a delicate topic. Sharing your knowledge of God is a delicate topic. Sharing something with family members during Thanksgiving or whatever, or, or at workplace, is a delicate topic. But my friends, we have only one life, and the time is short. May this be something that encourages you. Be the bridge. Because the moment we are not being the bridge, we are being the obstacle that prevents people from finding Jesus Christ. Are these six points that we can think of? Maybe you won't remember all six of them, but at least something you can hold on to. Something that you can hold on to. And if you forget, just look at the woes that Jesus gave and read them in reverse. If this is the desire for you as a church, as we are entering into 2020, I want to have a special prayer that 2020 can be a different year. Can be a year that could be a turning point for our neighborhood, for our life for the people that come in contact with us. Because church is not the building, church is you, wherever you go. So let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us truth, for allowing us, Lord, to be challenged every single day through Scripture. Lord, it's easy to be accommodated. It's easy, Lord, to just lay back and watch another year go by. The challenge, Lord, is to take action. The challenge is allow you to bring transformation in our life that leads us to action. Lord, we don't want to live a life of appearances. We want to be the temple of the Spirit. We want to live out the fruits of the Spirit. And as we are doing so, that the name of Jesus Christ may be lifted high. And that when people see us, they see Jesus Christ and his actions and how he lived. May love abound. May love overflow in this congregation. May we be the bridge that leads people to Jesus, Lord. 
instead of being the wall and the obstacle, Lord, that prevents them from doing so. Lord, in the hearts of all of our members here, there is something. There are changes that ought to be made, Lord. There are sins that need to be put aside. There are relationships that need to be restored. There are health issues that need to be addressed. Lord, help us depend on you, understanding that you are in control of our life and that you love us more than anything. And by understanding and receiving your love, may we live, may we share that love to those around us as well. Bless this congregation. Bless us as individuals, Lord. And may 2020 be a significant year, Lord, in how we shine the light of Jesus Christ to the world and the neighborhood that we are in. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. May God bless you all, my friends. You're invited to have a good lunch with us now.